Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a classic creationist video. This is one that probably would have faded into obscurity if Logic hadn't done a series on him back in 2012, but every now and then I see his name pop up in my comments and today I thought, what the heck, I'll do my own take on the guy. I'm speaking, of course, of self-styled chemist and scientist John Morris Pendleton, who puts on a lab coat and introduces himself as a chemist for his videos, but fixes cars when he's not moonlighting as a fake scientist. Seriously though, search for his name in any database of scientific publications, and you're more likely to find papers by the midwife from the UK who happens to also be named John Pendleton than you are to find anything from this John Pendleton. Now, as I have pointed out numerous times before, qualifications aren't everything. I myself am not qualified in chemistry, and Johnny here actually does have some formal education on the subject, so he's closer to being able to call himself a chemist than I am. The difference is that I'm not artificially inflating my credentials in order to lend myself credibility. I am completely honest about my lack of qualifications. That's one of the reasons that I always have a source list in my description. But enough background, let's see what the guy actually says. Hello once again, I'm chemist John Morris Pendleton. Hello, chemist John Morris Pendleton, who doesn't actually do any chemistry-related work. I'm video producer Vice Rhino. See? I can make my title sound more important than it actually is, too. And as a bonus, I actually do produce videos. And we're now in our fifth conference, and this is one of the really exciting ones, because I know it's a question that lots of people have. What is the age of the Earth? Current estimates place the age of the Earth at 4.543 billion years old, based mostly on the radiometric dating of zircon crystals using uranium lead series dating, which happens to be one of the dating methods that can be used with the isochron diagram, since there is a non-radiogenic isotope of lead. For those of you who may not remember, a radiometric dating method that can be used with the isochron diagram is one where the initial conditions that creationists complain about being assumptions are directly tested. Uranium series dating is one of the most accurate dating methods that we have. When did the creation actually occur? And of course, we're going to go to the Bible. Because naturally, when a chemist is doing their work, they first turn to the Bible. Because the Bible has answers for everything, right? The Bible certainly shows signs of knowing what atoms are and how their electrons interact with each other, right? Now, by comparison, looking at two timelines, one of what the Bible says, one of what uh, evolutionists say. Only those two? Well, an evolutionist might be tempted to start their timeline when evolution started, so that would be a bit over three billion years ago. What about the gravitationalists? Their timeline probably begins about the same time as the universe. How about the thermodynamicists, the relativists, the plate tectonicists? Just because you don't like a certain branch of science doesn't mean you just get to put an ist on the end of it and lump everyone who accepts that branch of science into a category of people who you'd like to think just accept that branch of science without critical evaluation. We have the creation of everything happened about 6,000 years ago. About 4,400 years ago, the worldwide flood occurred of which eight people were saved. That is quite the genetic bottleneck. You'd think we'd be able to see some evidence of that happening if we were to examine our genome, which we don't. Closest we see is a bottleneck event some 70,000 years ago where humanity dwindled to a population of just a few thousand individuals. So pretty severe, but also a few orders of magnitude larger than the eight people that you are suggesting. And what's more, it's possible that the appearance of the genetic marks that make us think bottleneck could just be the result of humans leaving Africa in several small waves rather than all at the same time. So the last population bottleneck for humans still has orders of magnitude more survivors than your hypothesis and it might not even have been a bottleneck. So given this, do you have any evidence to support your position aside from an ancient Hebrew myth that has its roots in an earlier Babylonian myth? Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary 2,000 years ago, and we expect that maybe in the next five minutes that he could come back again to rule the earth. That event has been about five minutes away for the last 2,000 years. Case in point, I have no idea when this video was originally recorded, but the channel I found it on uploaded it in 2006. 
If someone told you that they were expecting their friend to join the party any minute now, would you still be patiently waiting for their friend 14 years later? Or would you perhaps suspect that they might have been mistaken long before that? Are you ready? He could come back. He is coming back, and it could be soon. Way to hedge your bets there, John. It could be soon, but it could also be another 2,000 years. Side note, but the whole Jesus coming back any minute now and the end of the world thing just got me thinking. One of my favorite things to do when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking is to let them get to their part about all the horrible things that are happening in the world, and then bring up the fact that, historically speaking, this is the best time to be alive so far. We live in a society where often the poor have a better quality of life than royalty of only a couple hundred years ago. Crime has been on a significant decline in the last 25 years. Technology is such that I get a notification on my phone if my kids don't show up to school, and you can buy watches with GPS trackers on them so that if your kid goes missing, you can find them faster. The only reason things always seem to be getting worse is because our communication has gotten so much better. If a kid went missing in LA in the 60s, people in New York were not likely to hear about it. But now, everyone can know. So we hear about more crimes than we're used to, giving us the impression that there are more crimes. Meanwhile, the actual crime rates are dropping sharply. The poor JWs don't usually know what to do with this information. They're just used to people agreeing that these are indeed terrible times that we're living in. Now, according to the Big Bang Theory and evolution, it was about 20 billion years ago there was a Big Bang, a big explosion. Close. It was 13.8 billion years ago. You're only off by 6.2 billion years. That's not a lot, right? Just a rounding error? Because obviously 13.8 rounds up to 20, right? Also, pretty sure evolution doesn't say anything about the origin of the universe, so there's that. Moons and moons of years went by. 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth was formed. Well, that one's closer. Now, to be fair, this video is old enough that maybe scientists were saying that the universe is 20 billion years old and the Earth is 4.6 billion years old when it was filmed. I don't know, and I don't really care enough to look into it, so let's just keep going. From where they don't know? No, they know. It was the accretion disk of debris that the entire solar system formed out of. This debris was mostly formed through stellar fusion in the cores of other stars that had already gone through their whole life cycle before our sun began its cycle, and the heavier elements would have been formed during the violent explosions of these earlier stars. It collected water began raining on the Earth, and three billion years ago, the first life forms appeared, which survived, had something to eat, and were interested and able to reproduce themselves into all the forms we have today. Slow down there, Sparky. You're skipping over a lot of steps and oversimplifying to the point of absurdity. Where exactly the Earth's water came from is not known for certain, but that being said, hydrogen is by far the most common element in the galaxy and probably in the universe, with oxygen being the third most common element. Given that water is two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, a relative abundance of water in the universe is expected. And since we see water in various forms scattered all over our solar system, it's not surprising that one of the planets happens to have a lot of water on it. Water is also an almost universal solvent, meaning that most things can dissolve in water. So we have Earth, still really hot, collecting water, water evaporating into the atmosphere, and then raining down on the Earth again, dissolving different minerals and compounds as it goes. But when it evaporates again, it leaves the minerals and compounds behind, leading them to increase in concentration, eventually leading to life. This is one of several abiogenesis hypotheses, and it's a creationist favorite because it's the one that leads them to the erroneous statement that evolutionists believe we evolved from a rock. This is only true in the very loosest of senses. In the same way that I could say that you are made of rocks because your body is made of roughly 4% minerals. But no, the first thing that we might actually call a living organism would likely have had some minerals in its composition, but that does not make it a rock, even if it was mostly minerals. I mean, it was probably mostly water, just as life today is mostly water, so saying that it was a rock is less accurate than saying that a person is a lake. So Kent Hovind, if you're listening to this, maybe change it up a bit and instead of saying, oh, evolutionists think we evolved from a rock, you should switch it to evolutionists think we evolved from a lake, because that's actually probably closer to the truth than the rock one. I mean, it's still horribly inaccurate, but it's slightly less horribly inaccurate than your usual line. But John hasn't said that yet, so let's give him the benefit of the doubt for now. Back on track, they had something to eat. 
Well, the first organism would have just been absorbing the components that it needed from its surroundings. Being interested in reproducing is a weird way to phrase that. It wouldn't have had the capacity to have interests, it just would have happened. And so far, we haven't even gotten to the hard part of abiogenesis, the figuring out what the first genetic molecule would have been, because there are some genuine difficulties with abiogenesis. After all, if there weren't any difficulties, this wouldn't be an active area of research. But the simple parts that we've done here, the moving, eating, and reproducing, they have already been replicated in a lab setting. It only takes five chemicals, including water. It was so easy that the researchers had to purposely and literally muddy the waters. Five chemicals was too simple. There wouldn't have been anywhere on the earth where only these five pure chemicals collected. There would have been a big muddy mess of chemicals. So they did the same experiments again, but this time with some complex organic black tar that would have been similar in composition to the kinds of compounds found on the early earth, with the same results. So. John, are you saying that these oil droplets with organic tar inside them had interests? Or were they maybe just behaving according to the laws of physics and chemistry? Now, where do we get the idea from the Bible that the creation of everything happened 6,000 years ago? By adding up a bunch of genealogies, of course. And this is a reliable method because it has never been demonstrated to be possible to write down a genealogy with inaccuracies in it. In the Bible, beginning with chapter 5 of Genesis, we have genealogies. And we start with Adam, and it gives the age of the father when a key son was born in the line that eventually reached to Jesus Christ. Yeah, sure. So we can either trust genealogies written by people who sometimes write things down wrong for one reason or another, or we can trust the uranium lead dating of zircon crystals with the isochron diagram, which is independently verifiable data that is not subject to human opinions and biases. Which one of these methods do you suppose is more accurate? Okay, I know John thinks the genealogies are more accurate, but really, looking at it objectively, we have genealogies from other sources that we know are not accurate. Julius Caesar was not a descendant of Romulus and Remus. Since we know that genealogies can be recorded inaccurately, why would we trust a genealogy over radiometric dating? And so we begin adding up these ages, and we come up that the flood occurred 1,656 years after the creation. Pretend genealogies that give a time frame for a pretend flood. Okay. Any evidence for this flood at all? No? Wait, there's actually a bunch of evidence against a worldwide flood? Hmm. Now I'm skipping ahead a bit. He's just continuing to add genealogies until you get Jesus. That's a total of about 4,000 years. From Christ to today is 2,000. 4 plus 2 is 6,000 years. Indeed. But what evidence do you have to suggest that any of these genealogies are actually accurate and reliable? Are you just assuming it because you start with the assumption that the Bible is accurate? For those of us who don't have this as a starting assumption, could you please help us get there? You know, with, like, evidence and stuff? Now let me give you a little suggestion. When God reveals a truth in his word... He reveals it many, many times from different angles in different ways. That is wise. Doing it from many, many angles in different ways is more likely to leave all parties satisfied. Now, from the evolutionary standpoint, their clock is called the geological time scale. That's one of them, sure. That's not the one that gives us the age of the universe, though, just the age of the Earth. The idea is this. These numbers here represent millions of years in the evolutionary time scale. I thought it was the geologic time scale. Make up your mind, would you? And the idea is that the oldest rocks are furthest in the earth. On top of them are younger rocks. On top of them are younger rocks. And so goes the sequence. Generally speaking, yes. Though certainly an inversion after the fact is possible. Usually, though, an inversion refers to an area where old rock has been uplifted to a point where some of it is physically higher than its younger neighboring rock than actually the flipping of the sequence upside down. But yeah, it is a basic fact of geology that the sediment that will make up sedimentary rock layers will be deposited nearly horizontal with the oldest material on the bottom, because that's how gravity works. You can test this yourself. Dig a hole in the ground and then throw a bunch of sand in. After the sand is settled, throw a bunch of gravel in. I'd be willing to bet that when you're done, the sand will be mostly on the bottom, with a few grains here and there having poofed up and mixed with the gravel when the gravel hit it. 
Now, we ask the evolutionist, where can we go in the world to see exactly, in sight, these layers of rocks exactly as you've laid out there? And the answer is almost nowhere, because billions of years is a long time and things like earthquakes happen. And the Earth is not some homogenous system where deposition is happening universally over the whole planet at the same time. In some places, there is no deposition. In others, there is a lot of deposition. But there are a couple of places where all of the major geologic periods are represented. North Dakota is one such place. And what's more, when you look at all of the layers individually, it becomes clear that none of them could have been caused by a global flood. My favorite example is the Madison group of the Mississippian, where enough crinoid remains are found that had they all been alive simultaneously, it would have been enough to cover the entire planet to a depth of three inches. And that's just one small segment of this Mississippian crinoid bed. It is an almost worldwide formation being found in Arizona, Colorado, Alaska, England, Belgium, Western Canada, Russia, Egypt, Libya, Central Asia, and Australia. So, just the North Dakota section can cover the planet in three inches of dead crinoids. How much deeper in crinoid corpses would we be if we were to calculate it for all of these locations? If it's just three inches per location, that's three feet of crinoids covering the entire surface of the planet at one time. The only way to have that many crinoids exist is to have their existence span tens of millions of years. We're thinking, where could we go? Oh, I know. We could go to the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Yeah, you could go there. Not all of the geologic periods are represented there, but the Grand Canyon is an excellent place to study geology. And when actually studied, rather than just superficially glanced at, it makes it entirely obvious that its layers were formed slowly over millions of years, not instantly in one year. If you want more detail on that and how we know several of the individual depositional environments of the Grand Canyon, I discuss that in more detail in this video. Link is in the card in the corner and in the description. That hole is almost a mile deep. We have all kinds of layers of rock. Guess what? About 50% of them are missing. They're only missing if you'd expect them to be everywhere. But as I mentioned, deposition is not a universal event. Local environments do exist. Shocking, I know. But to have a complete geologic record of every geologic time period is expected to be the exception rather than the rule, and that's exactly what we see. Now, that being said, a global flood would certainly be a global event, right? So if the layers were deposited in a single year-long global flood, we would expect all of the layers to be universally represented no matter where we dig. And as you yourself are pointing out, that's just not the case. So one more line of evidence against Noah's flood. Thanks for that. Will John figure out an actual line of evidence for a young Earth, or will he continue to flounder, pretending that a human-authored genealogy is that evidence? Tune in tomorrow to find out.